going to be Open the Eyes of My Heart. If you'd like to follow along so you can see where the notes go up and down, it's on page 3008 in the green book. Otherwise, feel free to use the screen. We invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we join in this song.
bonfire are pledges that will make the fire grow brighter. Um, pass it on. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. Uh, 572 in the hymnal, again on the screen. Please take a moment to fill out the fellowship pad located in your pew. These are collected each week, and Judy, who has just been with us for a few months, is using them both to learn people's names and to pray for us. And one more announcement. So up here we have our campfire, and last week we handed out these glow sticks as reminders of our commitment. So if you did not make a pledge last week, then during the passing of the peace, please come to the front. Ron will be here, and he'll help you. And if you have your pledge with you, he will give you one of these glow sticks in return. And so finally, one of the best things, speaking of it, about Christchurch Troy is the fellowship that we share with each other. So if you can, stay for the coffee hour after the service so we can chat. And for now, it is the tradition of this congregation to pass the peace of Christ to each other very vigorously. So if you are able, then get up, please stand, and greet your neighbor.
the one who helped him, said the man. Then you can be a neighbor to anyone who needs your help, said Jesus. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you that we can be a neighbor, that we can help anyone who is hurting that we come across. And we thank you that many of your sons and daughters have been a neighbor to us and have helped us too. Bless each child who hears the story today. We pray in the spirit of Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. We are introducing a new song today as we get ready for the prayer. We invite you to remain seated. It's number uh, 492 from the hymnal, or once again, it'll be on the screen. Uh, prayer is the soul's sincere desire, and we're singing verses 1 and 6. even in the midst of troubles, even in the midst of worries, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of bereavement. We thank you for your still, small voice in our hearts that provides assurance and guidance, a holy presence. You have set us in the midst of others. Others who may need what we can give and we may receive what others can give. We thank you that you bring us together in a world where there is so much that can tear us apart. Guide the employees, the employers of this land 
so that they may use wealth in a way that all will find suitable and fulfilling employment and receive just payment for their labor. Let us remember before you those who suffer from discrimination. Guide the leaders of this world so to use power that all may find just and honorable treatment. We remember before you today all who suffer from illness. Guide the healers of this world that they may use their strength from you that all may find healing and caring. We remember before you today those who suffer from bereavement. Guide all who come in contact with them that they may show your care, your compassion, your love. Guide the leaders who are indifferent to your earth that they might remember that we are totally dependent on the earth, that we are earthlings, and that we must take care of it. We remember before you today those who have been instrumental in our lives to bring us to a good place, those teachers who, even if we didn't want to learn, taught us. Those parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, even people not related to us by blood who reached out to us and gave us a glimpse of who you are and whose we are. Let us remember before you today all who suffer from depression, from mental illnesses that they do not deserve but which force them to live in ways that are less than ideal for them. Help us in our dealings with others and in our listening and learning and in our voting and in our ways of influence to remember all who need your care. We thank you for Jesus who with his words and his deeds, with his dying and with your resurrection, showed us what it means to be a good neighbor. We pray for all today who have no one to pray for them, who have no one to remember them in the congregation. Those who live on the edge with very little money, very little food, very little shelter. And encourage us for, to look for ways to demonstrate your love to them. All this we pray in the spirit of Jesus who taught his disciples to pray in a language unfamiliar to us and so we join in this translation. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture is from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 46. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had left the Sadducees, Speechless, they met together. 
One of them, a legal es expert, tested him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Now as the Pharisees were gathering, Jesus asked them, what do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? David's son, they replied. He said, then how is it that David, inspired by the Holy Spirit, called him Lord when he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right side until I turn your enemies into your footstool. If David calls him Lord, how can he be David's son? Nobody was able to answer him. And from that day forward, nobody dared to ask him anything. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Suzanne. What is the greatest commandment of the law? You are a 30-something man born in Bethlehem of parents who were forced to be displaced persons because there was a price on your sweet, innocent head. You were raised in the backwater village of Nazareth in the province of Galilee in the country of Israel. Your mother's name is Mary and in Matthew's gospel you are known as the son of Joseph although we hear nothing of him after that trip to Jerusalem when you were 12. You have been traveling around the area preaching and teaching and, and even healing people and, and now some of the establishment religious types, experts in the law of Moses, the religious and civil law, are challenging you. They want to know if you're as familiar with the law of Moses as they are. They want to know if you have the chops to go head to head with them. And so they demand to know, what is the greatest commandment of the law? The ones wanting to know are the learned ones who have spent a lifetime studying every iota of the law, for they believe that in order to come before a holy God, it is necessary to know not just the Ten Commandments, but all of the over 600 plus laws found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And here these learned men are seeped in all that learning, testing you. You are barely into your 30s, and these men are clearly your superior in age. These are your learned professors. But you're up for this. For you too have learned the law. You know that not every piece of scripture carries the same weight. And you know that the greatest commandment is not up for question. And so you calmly state, quoting the words from Deuteronomy 6.5, you shall love God with all your heart and mind and soul. But. Then you go a step further. Then, quoting the words from Leviticus 19, 18, you add, and the second is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the others. The eyebrows of those asking the questions must have raised a little, for you have not only answered their question, you have gone a step further, and by adding, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are calling the people back to the law of Leviticus, which by their actions, it would be apparent they have forgotten. You are reminding these men that there is a trajectory in the law of Moses, a trajectory toward love of God and then beyond love of God, beyond love of tribe, to love of neighbor, meaning everyone. You will remind people that the good news of God's love for us is not an idea, it's a relationship. 
a relationship between us and God and a relationship between us and others that has to be enfleshed. It's an age-old question that has just been asked and you have answered. What is the greatest commandment? But you will embody the answer in a powerful new way. And then not content to simply answer their question, you ask one of your own a question that future scholars will wonder why you asked. Were you just proving to these scholars that you do have the chops to go head to head with them? Were you playing with them, saying in effect, you want to discuss theology? Try this on for size. Or were you looking for not just a correct answer, but for their thinking about the Messiah? The question you ask begins simply enough, whose son is the Messiah? They give the time-worn answer based on the prophecies that state that the Messiah will come out of the house of David, David's son, they say. But then comes the conundrum. Then how is it, Jesus asks, that David calls the Messiah Lord? If David calls the Messiah Lord, then how can he be David's son? Not surprisingly, no one was able to answer you, but it's an important point you were making in the guise of a question. For you know that the word son means more than biological progeny, that in the continuity of God, the Messiah must demonstrate what God is like. And being the son of David, the representative of David, is too small, not enough like God, that the Messiah must embody Well, apparently this deep theological thinking was too much for these learned men because you would find in the days ahead that nobody wanted to ask you any more questions. So you have answered the question put to you, the question about the greatest commandment, and you have answered that it is love of God and neighbor. But you know that most people think love is an emotion. Well, you know that that's not what this love means. You know there will come a time when leaders and the people they lead will announce that you can't legislate morality, but you also know from the laws of Moses found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that love means actions, actions like not harvesting to the edge of your fields so migrants can have food. Actions like building a fence around your flat roof where you entertain so your neighbors won't fall off. Actions like even if it's a Sabbath and one of the Ten Commandments is you shall do no work on the Sabbath, even so, if your neighbor's cow falls into the ditch, you will do the work of helping it get out. You know that the reason for the law is to ensure that love will be lived out. You know that morality must be legislated to ensure that neighbor is cared for. You know that left to our own devices, we will not put others first, but will do what benefits us. And so we need the law. You know that's why it's important to study the law. Because love involves hard thinking about what would be right in every situation to ensure that neighbor is cared for. You know, it's not all about us. It's about our neighbor. Furthermore, you know that love isn't just about being nice to people. That what's at stake here is what it means to be holy as God is holy. That the law is about ensuring the holiness of relationships. You know that love means acting in a way that's for the other person's and the world's well-being. You know love means even dying for your neighbor if necessary, which As it turns out, you do. For what would be the point of claiming that God gives us eternal life, 
that love is stronger than hate, that life is stronger than death, if you're not willing to back it up with your own mortal body. And so you let your enemies kill you. And then you are resurrected by God, and then a whole church arises out of your love. Let's think about that church. So, the original invitation was simple, clear, and good. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. It cut through the rules. It challenged the religious experts. It invited us to serve God and one another. Simple, clear, and good in a complicated world. That's when the early church found itself acting with courage to serve the common good. When Christians in community became agents of justice, mercy, compassion, and change. The faith of the church was its source. Faith offered the path to a simple way. Love God, love neighbor, and good things grew from it. The church was a game changer in education, in healthcare, in fighting poverty and human rights, and showing up in the midst of disaster. Many found their vocation, their purpose and passion in answering God's call. As the hands and heart of Christ in the world, but not always. Sometimes the church didn't do the right thing. Sometimes the church let us down big time. The church is full of problems, right? Because the church is full of people. And even the church is perfectly capable of breaking our hearts. Maybe you've noticed. Sometimes it feels like even the church has lost its way. Remember, love God, love neighbor. Sounds good, but sometimes we don't feel welcome seen, heard, or inspired. Instead of real, it feels repressive. Instead of engaging, it feels empty. Seriously. So we have a right to ask, is this still a place where I can make a difference? Is this a place where my gifts and my voice will be honored and where I can be a leader? Is the church still a game changer? Or has it just totally lost us? So we're forced to ask the question, do we stay or walk away? Well, in spite of all its flaws, the church is still our church. We can make it a place where we find signs of life, of love. Where something good might still be waiting for us and generations to come. Where people, however broken and divided, find, find a, a way, way to come, come together. The church can be a place where we ask the biggest questions under a very big roof and share the stories of our lives across generations and differences. So what do we do now? What will you do? Maybe what we all need to do now is take a step back. To the beginning, when things were simple. When once again, we bring heart, soul, and mind to be agents of justice, mercy, compassion, diversity, change, renewal. You and I can be leaders of the church. And together, we can create a church where no one's an outsider. A church that cares for others. A church that serves the common good. Where we're still the hands and heart of Christ. In the streets, the schools, the shelters. In the parks, the pulpit, the clinics. Standing with the abused, the neglected, the lost. Love God, love neighbor. Love God, love neighbor. Amen.
thank you for all that you have given us. And this morning we share our time, our talents, and to a small extent our treasures, so that the light of our mission can go out from this church, to shine in the dark places and bring hope and show God's love so that we can be neighbors. Amen. Christ's church is on a journey together, or together with Christ, questioning, serving, and growing. And so, looking through what we've got in our uh, bulletin today, I'll highlight a couple of things that are not in the bulletin. Coffee hour for November. There's still some openings for people to assist with coffee hour. Um, trained people are standing by to help you with the making of coffee or, or preparing the, what, where things are on a, on a Sunday morning. So um, if you feel that you would like to be a neighbor in our coffee hour, that's a way to be a neighbor there. Uh, we also have a week from Sunday, a week from today is our annual conference. And if you haven't already, if you're a leader and you haven't got your report in, it's due today. Um, so get those in. George is uh, compiling that into a book for um, next Sunday. Uh, other things I'll highlight. The Social Action Mission Team is finishing up with their the collection for October, which was toothbrushes and toothpaste. I'm not sure what they're collecting next month, uh, but we'll find out. Um, let's see, hit coffee hour, uh, hit that, hit that. Adult Forum under Ken is going on on Sundays at 9.30. Um, community meal, we're looking for somebody to assist there. Um, there is the Crossing Study at Judy's house on Thursday at 7 o'clock. And if the books haven't come yet, we will not be Okay, so if the books haven't come yet, we won't, there won't be a meeting this Thursday, okay. So stay tuned in your email and, and Facebook in a sector to find out whether we're on or off for Thursday. Is there anything else that anybody has to bring forward? Uh, if you have not given your pledge um, to bring light to the, the world through our missions, um, that's what the glow sticks are for those who are, are new to our fire here. Um, that's what the glow sticks represent is the fire of our mission going out. Uh, please get your pledge cards in so that we know where we're at. Right now we're about 50% in numbers and in amount, so that tells me that there's still some pledge cards sitting on a table somewhere needing to be done. Uh, so please get those in so that we can get that budget process going. And now we go to our last hymn, which is Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Uh, it'll be up on the screens or in the Faith We Sing, 2171.
return 